Welcome to the Forecast Podcast with Gary Lezak. And starring today is my partner, 25 years together, Andy Carraway. How are you, Andy? I'm great. How are you? (laughs) (laughs) I'm doing fantastic. Today, we're going to, first of all, this is sponsored by Results Personal Fitness. All right. I just got back. You'll be impressed. 65 pound dumbbell flies and presses. Wow. Come on. I don't know how you're doing it. Really? No, I don't. <laughs> I haven't done that for a long time. Yeah. So, but yeah, so so that's exciting. But results, personal fitness. Uh, that's David Schlossman and Steve and Don and Valerie and the whole gang over there, Chris. Go on in there. It's at 135th and Metcalf. That's our sponsor. Plus, Uphold Home. Uphold Home, a great system where you can stay at home in your golden years, and a great way to, by the way, get fitness experts, dietitians, nutrition experts to optimize your health in your golden years. Uphold home. Look that up uh, for your parents, etc. So today uh, we're going to talk about, it's interesting, the, the main topic is going to be the battle with food. Mm. Is that a good title? I think it's a great title. Okay, battle of food and addiction. Uh, Andy was on in one of our podcasts recently. You can go back and watch it. It's absolutely fascinating about uh, your battle with addiction. And we'll talk about that. But first. I want to say one thing. Yeah, please. Uh, the term battle. Okay. I don't like that term. I love um, it. Tell me. Well, uh, in, uh, in the addiction recovery community, um, one of the main elements is surrender. Uh, and what I mean by that is that once we have admitted that we have a problem, once we have identified that, you know, our life has become, as we say, unmanageable, um, that we don't have control, um, we are essentially giving up the fight. Um, we're surrendering. And the idea behind that is that we surrender to win. So, um, When people say, I'm fighting addiction, I'm battling addiction, I always point them to, you know, they won, it it won, the the addiction won, uh, because it basically rendered you powerless, as we say, um, because you no longer have control and you need to step away from the substance. Um, Your life has become unmanageable, so you need to practice abstinence. So I'm no longer fighting. Fighting indicates that I'm still trying to engage with the substance. Um, so, yeah, don't love the word battle or fighting addiction. And this is just addiction in a broad sense, right, for all the different addictions possible, uh, from alcohol and drugs to food. Yeah, I mean, I think it. food is a, a more challenging uh, addiction or, or issue to, to handle, because unlike other addictions like alcohol or um, other drugs, cocaine, let's say, we, we practice abstinence. You know, I'm not going to be using just a little cocaine. Huh? I'm not going to be drinking on the weekends and still try to be staying sober. It's all or nothing. Where food is so challenging because you can't not eat. And a lot of the nutrients like sugar, which are in food um, everywhere, you know, how are you going to avoid sugar? Because that's ingesting a substance. Like if that's what you're trying to avoid, um, it's really hard to navigate that. So food is so complex when it comes to addiction. So, yeah. Excellent. An excellent beginning to this podcast. And (laughs) we're going to get back to that in just one or two minutes. Uh, Andy and I uh, had challenges with food as we went to Miami to the Natural Disasters Expo, mm. and uh, getting to Miami was fascinating. We got to experience the new uh, KCI airport on our way back. We left the old KCI airport and came back to the new KCI airport. What did you think of that? I was amazed. It was way bigger and way more impressive than I anticipated. I remember when you first got off the airplane, like, oh, this is no big deal, but then it Kept going yeah. and going and going and going. I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, a nice little hall terminal. And then, yeah, we turned the corner and there's the walking or the you know moving sidewalk. 
And I'm like, whoa, you know, this is we're uh, the big time. Yeah, <laughs> we're in a big city now. Yeah, amazing. We got to Miami. Uh, I had a booth there for Weather 2020. The weather pattern is cycling. The LRC is my hypothesis, a discovery back from the 1980s. And I presented, met a whole bunch of people that came to the expo, got some really good contacts, and we're going to be sharing the LRC with the world, saving lives and helping businesses. And some of these contacts were just amazing. But that was uh, quite an event in Miami. Beyond that... What did you think of Miami? Just because you came in and sort of had a vacation while I was working. What was that like? Well, I mean, I saw where we stayed, which was South Beach, and uh, I was amazed. South Beach was clean. Um, Are you comparing it to Santa Monica? Well, yeah, because it (laughs) has kind of a Santa Monica vibe. Um, You know, it looks and feels a lot like Santa Monica, but it was clean, not nearly as congested as, uh, you know, Los Angeles can be. Uh, it was really nice. the The beaches are are clean and wider, and the waters. I don't. They don't turquoise blue. Almost. Yeah, they don't. I did. I wasn't imagining that, you know. And I felt like, well, this is almost just as good as Caribbean. But again, we were on South Beach, which I think is its own little um, paradise, and I think that's not indicative of what all of Miami is like. Right. It was beautiful. It was a really good vacation, and we were blessed with some really great weather. So you got down to the beach. Oh, yeah. It was awesome. I loved uh, enjoying the the little bit of sun and greenery, and obviously the, the ocean is always amazing. Right. On the other side of Florida, Hurricane Ian struck last year, and that's one of the main topics and the theme of, of the booth that we had at the Natural Disasters Expo On the west side of Florida, it sort of got destroyed by the hurricane. There were 125 to 145 mile per hour winds, beach erosion, what's called red dye. I didn't get to experience it, but it's just not good. If we went to Marco Island and Fort Myers or Naples, you there's sort of a smell a little bit. It's just it will recover in the next year or two. It'll it'll take its time, but that was a devastating hurricane predicted by the LRC, and we've got one predicted for between Miami. And Daytona Beach this September, and that'll be uh, one of the uh, key signature predictions of this season coming up. Is the red dye, is that like an algae thing? Yeah, I think so. And it, by the beach erosion or whatever happened with with the water and the, the sand, it caused that problem. Yeah, so. that's what I thought. So anyway, while we were in Miami, now we're going to get back to our main topic again, I uh, is food. While we were in Miami, I was sort of taking out customers and clients and having nice dinners, and I was eating healthy at these expensive dinners. And Andy was was, was not. I mean, he went out and, you know, he... he, Tell us about your experience with the food there. Well, I mean... It was good. I remember you telling me how good it was. It was good food. Um. I mean, it wasn't as bad as I think that you're making it out. I did try to um, eat some lighter, maybe not. Oh, weren't, it. weren't you I, on a taco diet? No, I did. <laughs> I did go to uh, a couple of taco shops because you know we have some here, but these look to be like more independent, um, fun taco shops that had all kinds of different variations. Well, there's one in our hotel. And yeah, I did that. And those were horrible. The the horrible stuff was like that restaurant we went to that had all the huge portions and all the huge right. desor- desserts, the cheesecake. I mean, Red, Red Velvet, Velvet cheesecake. cheesecake was like this big. It was crazy. We're not exaggerating. We've got a picture. <laughs> they can't see it. They're listening to it. I know. But this is this is also on YouTube. I know, but isn't this also on a like player? Yeah, they can't see it. Okay, I just yeah, just to... imagine a huge piece of red velvet cheesecake with red velvet cake in the middle, like two times the size of normal cake. Three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us. Uh, so so tell us about your experience. You 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 know, Andy used to be a personal trainer. He knows physical fitness. The best exercises, the proper way to do them. Uh, you are in good shape, okay? I mean, you are. You work out regularly. You do all the the body parts every week. Would you say? Yes. And and then your challenge is more diet. How important? How important is 
diet and and personal training, you know, weightlifting with weights. I mean, what is the balance there? What is the best way to optimize your health? Would you say you just asked a lot of questions? I know. So answer them all <laughs> right now. Uh, let's see. Well, let's start with maybe where you started. So I always hesitate to use that term personal trainer because when I was working at a gym, it was more like working with people um, on things like flexibility and, and biomechanics of how our body works. I was much more interested in the kinesiology of it all. I wasn't like the type of trainer that was like, let's go. Um, but yeah, I have, I have a lot of, uh, I think background knowledge of how our body should work. Um, years and years ago, even as a teen, I would pick up the, the muscle and fitness magazines and read them. When I first met you, you would spend an hour on the phone telling me about these things. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, you know, I, I have that sort of experience and I have tried to lift weights my entire life. Um, I feel like I've made a lot of gains functionally. I don't think I have great genetics um, for like, quote, bodybuilding. Um, so that was never anything that I thought about. Uh, well, seriously. But, you know, I feel like despite <laughs> my current weight and size, um, underneath there I have a pretty healthy frame and some decent musculature that if I lost maybe, I don't know. How much? 20 pounds, 30. <laughs> uh, 40. <laughs> I'm bad. Am I bad? That would be great. 40 pounds would if be If you lost 40 pounds, how would you look? I'd look pretty good. I mean, I would almost look a little too thin, probably. Okay. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, 215. Hey, you know what? Right now, I'd take 230. Okay. Sorry. That's yeah, all right. So so tell us about, you know, you in our last podcast, when you were here a few weeks ago, we talked about addiction and alcohol addiction and what you've gone through. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how how that can still be somewhat related to uh, a food addiction. That tell us the differences. I know there's a lot of questions again, but go from your alcoholism a little bit and and explain how it's hard. Alcoholics often end up having a food addiction too. Is it true? Am I, no, I'm completely. So there you go. So tell me, <laughs> educate me. Again, a lot of questions. Uh, um, so we we discussed the fact that I'm a recovering alcoholic uh, coming up here on five years in June. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I would say in conjunction with that, I have a food addiction to some degree. Like I said, food is such a tricky substance because we can't abstain from food and even if we want to abstain from like a macronutrient like a sugar or a fat um, it's almost impossible to eat meals that are I mean unless you're eating like vegetables solely everything's going to have some sugar or some fat excuse me sorry um, so as an alcoholic, you you have this experience where at some point in your disease, we'll call it, um, the the addiction has gotten out of control, and you decide I'm going to remain abstinent, I'm going to seek support, um, or I'm just going to do this on my own. And unfortunately, what happens to some people is that they fall off, you know, and we call that a relapse. Excuse me. My nose keeps itching. Um, and a relapse is obviously when somebody returns back to using. Um, some people, it's just a little relapse. Some people, it's a uh, a big relapse. And they might relapse and go out for years. Um, it might be one or two times. Uh, so relapse can look different for each person. As a borderline food addict, and I guess that's the the way I'll look at it, um, yeah, I, I feel like I have this sort of history that parallels my uh, what some people experience with drinking, where I think I've had times of what I like to call food briety, <laughs> where I was actually eating uh, properly or at least uh, much more healthily than healthier than I am now. And then I would fall off. And I've been off for 
several years now. I mean, I've really been um, struggling with keeping a consistent diet um, that has a balance to it and is lower in fats and sugars and all that good stuff. And the reason is, uh, one of the reasons is, is I think I justified uh, for many years now since being sober, well, at least I'm not drinking. So I will go ahead and just eat whatever I want. And that's just, um, to me, that's my uh, addict behavior showing itself. So tell us more about this. You know, as you said, you, you substituted it and you were like, hey, at least I'm not drinking. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, one feature of addiction is justification and or rationalization. So I think, well, no, I know that what I was doing is I was telling myself, and by the way, other people would tell me this too, um, when I start complaining about how poorly I was eating in terms of the, the quality and the quantity of food, and they, they would say, oh, but you look so much better than, than you did when you were sick and, you know, you almost died because of liver failure. And I'd be like, well, they're right. I, I do look a lot better. And so that just fueled my sort of confidence in, um, that I had the go-ahead to go eat um, as bad as I was. But, see, the problem is I have an addictive mind and so you give me a little bit of permission and I'm going to take it far. <laughs> so that's been my struggle. And like I said, I, I've been off, um, I've been off for a long time. Like I said, if I, if I'm comparing the idea of uh, relapse and, and, and alcoholism and periods of, of relapse and then periods of like, I call it food variety or, or where I'm eating properly, mine mirrors what somebody's alcoholic behavior has uh looks like over decades because i've been trying i've been struggling with this you know right since we've been together maybe even a little bit before um I've, you know, your mom used to make these delicious meals and you told me how great of a chef she was <laughs> she was and that you know and there there we go in a whole nother conversation you know my my mother uh, was an amazing cook i, I came from a family who made amazing food um, and they made it a lot, and everything we did was food. always dessert every single meal, right? Yeah, everything was celebrated around food. Obviously, the holidays, but also birthdays, and you know, we lived down in the Ozarks, or we spent a lot of time down the Ozarks. And my grandma was this amazing country cook, so I grew up associating warm uh, memories with food and good food. So it makes a lot of sense that even to this day. Uh, my brain is wired to respond very strongly to food. And that's why it's so hard for me when I feel um, deprived of certain foods. Um, my, my brain really craves that comfort that comes through uh, foods with a lot of caloric content and obviously a lot of like of the stuff that you need to watch out for in, in certain quantities and that would be obviously the fats and the sugars right so there's there's a balance and here you are you're you're having this you don't like the word battle this this uh this what would you call it this this uh some this well you know something with food you and i were talking before and while i said that the uh alcoholism or other drug addiction we, we i don't prefer the term battle because it, it indicates I'm still fighting with the substance and, and I'm not doing that obviously with, with drugs and alcohol, but with food I am because I'm still having to engage with it. I can't not eat. Right. And, and so if I make the switch and say, okay, well I'm going to eat as clean as possible, um, which I've tried before, I'm still interacting with nutrients that are, you might look at it as like I'm I'm triggering the chemical reaction to crave more. And that's what happens when people are in addiction. It, it's a craving related to uh, disease. Once I ingest a drink as an alcoholic, I want more and more. And the same could be say for if I was a, you know, a methamphetamine addict, you know, I do some, a little, and then I don't want to stop. I want to keep it going. And the same thing is true about food. 
And like I said, I can remain abstinent from drugs and alcohol. I cannot remain abstinent from food. You have to eat, right? Absolutely. So uh, Maria Victoria Houlihan came through uh, when we lived on the plaza. And remember, she came in, and she's a nutritionist, and she basically came through, and we got rid of 90% of our food. Remember that? Yes. And then... I started on the path of cooking and 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 trying to create healthy meals, and then we or, would order maybe Hello Fresh, and I would make meals and try to make them as healthy as possible. And uh, now we I, actually brought in a chef. We brought in twice. a chef. Yeah, <laughs> two different chefs. I know. They and they tried to make us, but they they would make unhealthy food. I thought so. Well, it was better than eating out. That's Anything's true. better than eating out. Anything's better than fast food, right? Or, or or most of the food that exists out there, I think. And, and if you eat at home, it's going to be going to be better. I think so. And that's where you give me this challenge, like Gary, you need to cook. <laughs> yeah, that was part of the deal, right? <laughs> With the retirement, part of the deal, part of the retirement deal. Yeah. That is, oh, I'm gonna be home so much and make so much food. We're gonna eat so much better. Uh, yeah, that has not happened, unfortunately. Because I'm working so hard with Weather 2020. You have to admit, I, it does look like I'm working, right? You know, it looks like you're working, <laughs> but you're not making food, and that was part of the deal. Okay, so we made a deal. I don't remember signing anything, but yeah. Uh, so I, I will work harder at that, okay? As you know, I keep saying that every week. Yes. So um, my diet's pretty good. You know, I eat pretty good. And I don't eat. I would say you eat really well. Really? Absolutely. Okay, so I eat really well, um, but still not perfect. If you get into really good shape, I think you can eat really well and still cheat a little bit and stay in that shape. So the goal is to maybe lose the 30 or 40 pounds, and then you can start cheating a little bit, but you can't fall off. You have to, like, still continue to be consistent. What? How would you inspire others that are – because, you know, America – America in general eats bad. Mm. Yeah, and tell us about that. Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to talk too much trash on America and the way they eat, considering the fact that I'm, you know, part of that population that struggles with um, the types and quantity of food that I eat. Um, I want to talk about what you were saying about your diet. Um, you, unlike me, fortunately or unfortunately, don't have that. A addict gene, we'll just call it that. I don't know um, if that's completely accurate, right. but some people feel like some of this is genetic, and you just don't have it. So not only are you not an alcoholic or an addict, you're also not you don't have addiction uh, addictive qualities towards food or anything else. Really, you know, right. any substances, caffeine, any of that. You're you, you're able to use things in moderation and give up if necessary, uh, which is you know obviously a stark contrast to what. I have to deal with. So regarding what most people eat and people that are um, inclined to go out and eat a lot of bad food at places that are mass producing food that has, you know, a lot of nutrients in it just to keep you coming back for more, um, you know, the people in America. And, and I don't know that you always have to be a, a food addict to suffer from uh, this as an American. I think just the plethora of options that are out there. Um, and I'm not going to talk badly about any one company, but there's, you know, a lot, you drive up and down like I 70 and every exit has uh, four or five, maybe, you know, more chain sort of little restaurants that you can hop into, you know, get yourself like a burrito or, you know, you know a Philly steak or, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, there's a lot of options out there and it's really easy not to have to, eat at home and that food is just not going to have, um, you know, the same quality control because it's mass produced and it's high in, in calories and, and the wrong type of macronutrients. So I think it's really for people in America, even if you're like not in a true addict, I think it's really easy to get caught in that cycle of just going to these places and, and you know, the, the weight in terms of like actual body weight, especially what most people are concern, concerned about, that subcutaneous, well, also, you know, both of the fats, the inner organ fat and the subcutaneous fat, um, that comes on, I think, slowly for some people. And I think it just like over years, it creeps up on people. 
and it gets to the point where um, people don't realize how deep into their condition that they are. And, uh, you know, I think the only reason that I've not gone over the edge with that, and I'm pretty close at times, is that I have still a workout regimen that I try to employ, and I do try to catch myself and say, okay, I need to make a decision to eat uh, more clean. And, and, uh, but what's so discouraging for me, uh, as it is for anybody who's tried to get clean from anything, is you fall off. And then if you, and like I said, this happens the same way for people who are trying to get sober. You know, you fall off and you go back to your old ways and then you get back on the, the bandwagon and you fall off. And, you know, those, com- those continued relapses are very discouraging. Right. And you get to the point like, you're like, well, why, why should I even try? I know this has never worked for me before. And, and I definitely think that's an issue for me in terms of my um, food consumption. Right. When I'm when I'm having a meal and it comes to dessert time, sometimes I'll treat myself a couple times a week, three times a week, maybe even. I'd like it to be just once or twice a week. I always talk to you, preach to you. Hey, Andy, have that one or even two days where you eat whatever you want. If you eat if you eat healthy five days and you have those, hey, listen, Friday and Saturday I can eat whatever I want. Believe it or not, that's the beginning. You can do that. You know, a lot of things you'll read, just have one cheat day. Let's start with two. Maybe you can get down to one. And then when it comes to dessert, you can have the dessert there and then just say no. In five minutes, you won't feel like eating the dessert. That sounds like great advice from a non-food addict. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yes, from somebody that doesn't have that sort of trigger chemical reaction that makes logical sense. What you just said sounds great, I, and and I I wish I could do that. But when I'm in the mode that I tend to find myself in mostly, I'll, you know, my brain will justify. Yeah, we could go into a whole conversation about how our brains get hijacked, especially in, in times of high stress, and the part of my brain that says, well, you know, I'm going to try to eat smart this day or this week, and then. I'm going to give myself a cheat day or a cheat meal here. Um, the part of my brain that is uh, re- wired for reward and survival says, nah, no, you go get what you want now. You know what's going to make you feel good. And for a lot of us, um, that's, you know, highly um, concentrated sugar and fat, you know, donuts and cakes and cookies. So the 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 non-addictive brain would be able to make a lot of sense out of what you just suggested um for people like myself um what happens is that i believe the term i always use is hijacked my brain gets hijacked by the the dopamine pleasure reward system and that's what um gets me every time i know i said a lot there right so i can have blueberries that that we call brain berries because they're a really good snack that you can just sit and eat blueberries if they're somewhat tasty they're they're you know there's a little sugar in in that but obviously that's a healthy treat but it's one thing to have those and substitute those for cookies if you're me it's just very challenging for for a lot of people yeah i mean if if i'm driving home and i'm hungry and have blueberries with you well uh, if i'm driving (laughs) home and i'm hungry and uh, maybe I've had a little bit of stress. You know, we know that there's a pretty direct correlation between stress and uh, addictive behaviors. Increased amounts of stress can cause um, some people to lean into their addiction more so. Uh, not the only cause, but, but definitely something that amplifies um, addiction at times. And I'm driving by a, a, you know, a fast food restaurant or a place that sells my favorite cookies or whatever. And I, and again, I'm like, well, well, I got blueberries at home and those would be really healthy. But then my brain starts to say, but I know what's going to be more rewarding right now. I want that cookie. I want that cookie. And, and, and yes, I do believe that if you can get yourself home and get those blueberries, you know, uh, right. you know, into your system, you know, you cra- you satisfy some of that craving. And I've done that, and it feels great when you do it. Um, but like I said, unfortunately, personally, my my history has just been 
repeated failures of trying to stick to anything like that for very long. So what do you see? Can you see you getting on, getting there? Do you feel like you're on the cusp of that right now, getting healthy or, or do you just, is it going to continue to, obviously it's probably going to continue to be a battle. Yeah. I mean, I have, uh, like when I was in Miami, when we were in Miami, I was, uh, I got inspired because despite the, the food and you know what I noticed down there, what? which is sort of crazy people eat a lot. I mean, those restaurants were full and there was people eating a lot of food and I kept thinking to myself, In huge portions. Yeah. How are they eating all this food and still, you know, it's a fit looking community, you know, and I'm assuming a lot of those people are there for travel, but, um, I got inspired. You see people running around and biking and rollerblading and skateboarding and, and you forget that, you know, where we live in uh, the Midwest, we have these months, which it's really hard to get outside and get inspired to be active. Um, but I got inspired. And so I made kind of a pact with myself that I was going to try to not eat as much um, highly processed and, and chain related food. Um so that's kind of what I'm doing now. Um, but I'm not setting any sort of goal per se, because like I said, I don't want to get discouraged and just fall off again. Right? No, you're very inspirational. I mean, you are, you're just a tremendous inspiration. I mean, you, you just, I mean, you laid out a mapping of how we can do this. Not that it's easy to do, but you just, in the last two minutes, you explained how you can probably do that, you know? Well, that's, you know, that's my new plan. Right. Uh, but uh, I need to start cooking. Yeah, right? and I need to stop uh, stopping at, right. you know, these places that serve fast and fatty and high sugar food. And, I, you know, I don't want to talk too bad. I don't want to get into the macronutrient discussion because there's some people who now say, oh, fats aren't as big a deal as right. they and it's really the sugars. And I think it's pretty universally accepted that sugars – our, our our biggest culprit and those are the things that will kill a lot of people through you know mainly you know diabetic type um conditions um i'm not a microbiologist i don't have a ton of education and well i have a lot of you know i've done some reading and researching and listening to to people talk about this stuff but um there's still i think some right debate about how to, you know, balance your proteins, your fats, and your right. sugars. And, and speaking of credentials, Andy has three degrees. Tell us about those. I have a, my undergrad is from Northwest Missouri State in uh, education, elementary education with uh, also an emphasis on special, special education. I have a master's in, from the University of Kansas in education as well. And then I have a master's from Abla University in counseling psychology. Wow. That's a lot of good credentials. It's a lot of school. I know. Amazing. Well, hey, Andy, this is a great topic. We could go on and on and on and on. I'm going to start cooking. Okay. All right. In the next few months. You, you heard it here. <laughs> next few days, maybe a few weeks. I'll try to find some time for that. I think I'm going to like doing it. It's just, it's hard. I got to have all the ingredients and I'm trying to be healthy. I'm trying to make it tasty and good. So then uh, you'll enjoy the meal. But I'm do, I do pretty good at it when it, you know. Yeah, you do. I mean, if you have it there and you make it and it's, it's tangible and I can get my hands on it. Right. Yeah. And the stuff you make is. More than edible, so. More than edible. There you go. More than edible with Gary Lezak. I forecast health for Andy and me both. And Rainbow and Sunny are dogs. We need to talk about them on our next podcast. Are they wonderful or what? They're amazing. I know. They're sitting in the car waiting for us right now. All right. Thank you, Andy Carraway, for this topic and inspiration. And as usual, you, you did it again. Thank you for inspiring us. You're an amazing person. And I love you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I appreciate every all those kinds work, kind words you said, and uh, I don't know about the whole inspiration part, but uh, but I do like talking about making ourselves better. You inspire me every oh, day. Thank you. You do. All right. It's called the forecast with Gary Lezak, sponsored by Results Personal Fitness. <laughs> 65 pound dumbbells today. I'm very proud of that. And uh, head on over there, 135th and Metcalf, David Schlossman. 
uh, the owner there, and Jana and, the, and all them. So, and then also Uphold Home. Thank you for listening and watching the podcast. It's called The Forecast with Gary Lisak, and I forecast great things ahead, and we'll have one coming up next week. Thank you to Andy. Thanks. Thanks.